Uh, a little background, why am I interested in this? Um, 1973, I was about 10 years old. I know that was a little bit before some of y'all's time, but uh, at that time it made a, a lot of, a big impression on me, the fact that we had this whole thing called the uh, oil embargo, and the fact that we had gas lines and things like that out there. So in my background, you know, in and amongst always doing this uh, Air Force stuff, I've always kind of done some reading along these lines. So when we came to the War College, uh, I've got some great bosses to support us going out and doing other things. And we, so we started that Energy and National Security Elective last year, and uh, it's got some great responses. So we're going to keep doing it. And part of that is people continue to ask us to go out and do some talking about energy. Kent Butts is my teammate. Two weeks ago, you had him up here talking about water issues. And he already assured me that he prompted some questions for you. So I think it'll be a fun time for this afternoon. Uh, next slide. Hey, it works. Why do you show that slide, Tom? Well, especially if you're someone from another country and they look at that slide, what is the first thing you think they think? West? Where's that person from? That's what us Americans say, right? But if you're living in another country, what do they say? United States, right? Very American picture. What else do you notice? What makes that an American picture? Cowboy? It's on his horse? We talk about freedom. See any fences in that picture? Is that horse constrained by anything? Sort of represents our history and our mobile society, right? Start on the East Coast, moving West Coast. That's going to be kind of a theme all the way through today. Go back to our Constitution a little bit. Forefathers thought about things, and one of the things they pushed, embedded within the words there, is uh, the fact that we pretty much follow a free market system. We really believe in that as far as uh, ensuring domestic tranquility. How's all that tie together? That picture may bring back some memories of maybe not so much domestic tranquility. Maybe somebody else telling the United States, hey, we don't like what you're doing politically, globally. And we were constrained by the lifeblood we call energy, especially petroleum energy. Could we be constrained again? Come on, discussion. <laughs> yes. Good answer. What's going on over in Iran right now? That could be constraining, couldn't it? So much so that Congress asked our uh, folks at the Energy Information Administration to basically compile a special report that if you go online, you can pull it up, and it's about 30 pages long. It was just published on the 29th of February. It basically says, what's going to happen to the price of oil and the availability of oil should something happen? And it talks about where we get that oil from, and I'm going to give you a little hint on that as we go through today. We don't necessarily in the United States buy our oil from Iran, but a lot of other people do. And it's a global commodity. So if they can't buy it from Iran, they're going to compete and try and buy it where we buy it, right? Part of that free market system that we all agree to. That's what's best for the world. That's our challenge. That's part of it. So going back to the guy on the horse, would his preference be to ride that high-speed train for his mobility or potentially the other vehicle up there? Anybody know what that vehicle is? Um, what? Option two. How many, how many got here tonight with option one? I'm going to let Susan, Suzanne finish here. Okay, I've got a sufficient number of blue spots that I'm seeing out there, right? We like that freedom. We like that individual mobility. Anybody know what that vehicle is on the right? A what? That's part of the manufacturer. Nope. It's a Lotus. I'm sorry. A, um, it's made by Lotus. It's actually the all-electric version of the Lotus, and I just went blank on that. But uh, we'll get back to it. I'll remind you later. That's an all-electric car, though. Doesn't depend on domestic oil. Doesn't depend on foreign oil. 
It's a great vehicle. It's a Tesla. I knew I'd remember it. Sorry about that. So, as we go through, think about what we respect as far as freedoms, and we'll talk about oil primarily today, but I hope in the question and answer, you start dragging out some sort of that sustainability, renewable energy stuff. I kind of stay that on the side a little bit as well. Okay. Stumble over this article. Uh, it's basically about 21 pages, quick read. Highly recommend it. You can download it for free. It's written by a gentleman named uh, Andrew Holland. He worked for Senator Hagel as one of his economists. And he uh, basically, in one article, and that's why I recommend it, it's pretty easy, and uh, I added the triangle. But normally every issue having to do with energy, you can fit into that triangle. Either it's like petroleum, it's an energy security issue primarily, or if you want to talk some of the renewables, like solar photovoltaic, everybody gets worried about the economic impact, how much it costs, should I do it? Almost every, in fact, everyone that I'm aware of, energy issue has some sort of correlation, so to speak, with a particular portion of that triangle. I'll focus on energy security, but even with petroleum, if you want to talk about Bakken, if you want to talk about Keystone XL, we can talk about that during the uh, question and answer, and we can get into some of the other issues with that. So, a little bit of science. Anybody know what a BTU is? Okay, so that's the definition. What is it? Measure of energy, right? Anyone seen what a, uh, a BTU looks like? Can you describe it to me? You guys got to talk about it. No. Anybody see what's in my hand? It's a wooden match about this size. If you burn this match all the way down, it will give off one BTU worth of energy. So if you take anything away from this, you can now tell your grandkids, your kids, you know, your grandparents what a BTU is, what a BTU looks like, one match. So if you're a scientist, I can't replicate it here, um, if I were to burn that match all the way down, you would basically take a pound of water and raise that one degree Fahrenheit, okay? So up on the board there, if you look in blue, especially with gasoline, this, in this small container, contains one gallon of gasoline, or it should if I had it full. But it contains 125,000 BTUs, or 125,000 matches worth of energy in order to power your car. One gallon of gasoline right here, 125,000. That's a lot of energy. That's hard to substitute with something else like ethanol, like LP gas, some of the other things you see up there. And you can actually, if you look up there, you can see diesel at the top has even more energy, 138,000 BTUs in one gallon. So we think about substitution or alternatives, it is hard to beat this. We don't necessarily like it, we're just comfortable with it. We know it. It smells, it's in our hands, stays in our hands because it's absorbed by our skin, it's not very good for us. But guess what, guys and gals? We're pretty darn addicted to this stuff because it has such a high energy content. Okay? So do a little math. If your car gets 25 miles to a gallon and it's going through 125,000 BTUs, how many BTUs per mile is that? 5,000 BTUs, right? If you're on the lower end of that, called the net energy amount, that's the gross energy is 125,000. It's a little bit over 4,000 BTUs. That's a lot of heat just to go a mile. Every single car, every single truck is burning about that amount. That is a lot of energy. So alternatives are difficult. Remember to put this. So, one of the questions you could say is, okay, why don't we go to ethanol? When I was in high school, I was still frustrated about this. I made ethanol. It worked out pretty well. I came from the Corn Belt there in Minnesota. They're, they're actually producing a bunch of it up there. Everybody goes, ah, I use a lot of water and things like that. You're right. 
So it's not the perfect solution. So you can go back to that triangle and go, ethanol, good, it's made in the United States, much more energy secure. Ethanol, not so good sometimes, because A, it doesn't have the energy content that we're used to, but also we have some environmental factors, right? It's an economic factor. We have to make these trade-offs. Every energy decision is going to be a trade-off. There's no perfect one-for-one -one solution to this problem. Let's think about it. You're right, and we'll talk more about that during uh, question and answer. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. Or if we just used our heat better, you could have popcorn based on the heat off of your engine, right? So anybody know? Here's another trivia question for you. If you were to take all that energy and figure out where it was lost in the process of burning and going all the way down to your wheels to get you to go that one mile, how efficient that process is or inefficient? Only about 25 to 30% of that energy in that gallon of gas actually turns your wheels. Most of it is lost to heat. We're kind of wasteful, aren't we? Now, if you take that Tesla with that lithium-ion batteries in it, that energy efficiency of that vehicle uses 90%, only loses 10% between moving the electricity from when it's stored in that battery to making your wheels turn. So ask me about Chevy Volt when we're uh, in Q&A. Okay, I realize you probably, I got ahead of myself there. The um, reason I show this, President Obama introduced this slide about a year ago, actually on the 30th of March, he used this slide. I actually copied it off the website and put it on here. What it shows is how much of petroleum energy goes towards transportation, that big C up there, um, backwards C from your perspective. Let's see how well the laser works right in here. Another important number up there that's just scary is 6.9 billion barrels of oil is what the United States consumes every year. 6.9 billion, with a big B, barrels of oil. If you didn't know, a barrel of oil is 42 gallons. 72% of that works out to be about 4.9 billion just for transportation, okay? Now, the other big number up here to look at is 72%. I'm going to move to the next slide. It's a little bit busy, but just follow the logic here a little bit. Trust me. You'll see right there, it's 71%, 72%. I guess the president can change the number by one if he has a different view of rounding error. But on the right side, I'm sorry, your left side, my right side, you'll see all of our primary sources of energy. We've got petroleum, we've got natural gas, still a petroleum product. We've got coal, still a carbon product. Renewables and nuclear electric, or the nuclear energy that we use to generate electric, and that's coming across over here. If you want to copy this slide, just go on the Energy Information Administration website, and I can actually, I see it's cut off there, but it's right in their total energy piece, and it's pretty easy to find. Another thing that show your friends kind of thing. And what it breaks down is, for petroleum example, it says 71% is used over here in transportation of the total petroleum amount. It breaks down between industrial processes, residential, electric power. Why would we actually use petroleum to generate electric power? Anybody heard of peaker plants? That's when we're really using a lot of energy, and we need folks to turn on their backup generators. Hershey Hospital has a huge set of backup generators. And sometimes we need those folks to bring those online to relieve the amount of power being generated across the major grid. So that's where we get that 1%. Another trivia thing for you. Natural gas. Price of natural gas coming down, isn't it? Good stuff, right? Why? It's available, right? Why is it newly available? Marcellus, down in Texas, are doing the same thing. We're more familiar with Marcellus. We can talk more about that in Q&A as well. So I'm giving you a lot of stuff for Q&A. Renewables. Oh, here's one other thing to think about. Petroleum, natural gas, and coal. Do we use them for a primary source, or do we use them to do something else in order to get what we need? For example, go ahead. Yeah, coal. We don't necessarily use coal directly. We use coal 
to heat up hot water, to turn a turbine, to generate electricity. And that's where we lose a lot of that efficiency. You look at renewables like photovoltaic, solar thermal, you know, the hot water going through the, uh, the coils and such, that's direct energy. Directly the photons coming off the sun, going onto this uh, photovoltaic cell, stripping an electron off and actually going and powering your house. That's pretty darn efficient, okay? Now we come over to the right side, my left. Transportation. I'm gonna blow this up in the next slide, but quite a bit of our petroleum energy goes into transportation. Not much on the renewable, you're not gonna see anything on the coal. Industrial still uses quite a bit of uh, petroleum. Think about your plastics, it's converting over from copper to a lot of uh, plastic pipe in your houses and things now. So that's where a lot of that energy gets used up. Residential and commercial, a little bit. Electric power, primarily coal for electric. A little bit of the renewables, a lot of wind power out west. We could be doing better though. And then uh, nuclear, almost 100% of nuclear goes into that. In fact, I think it's like 99.99 .99 to the point where it's rounded up to 100. Okay, the big number there, I blew this up, 94%. So what's that mean? On the transportation side, looking back at petroleum, 94% of our transportation, much like the big C, light vehicles, trucks, things like that, are dependent upon petroleum. Is that a national security issue? Absolutely. How does our food get to the grocery store? Trucks, not rail. How do we move across the nation? How do we move around the world? That is a big deal number, 94%. Okay. The folks at the Energy and Information Administration, good friends, good relationship with the school, uh, built this slide. What it shows you is our dependency on energy and petroleum consumption across the top total. And then in the blue line, you can see our domestic supply. The gap is the amount of energy that we import. You can see that when the economy's not doing so well, not as much imports. When the economy's doing well, lots of imports. I'll show you a couple other diagrams coming up on that as well. The forecast out to 2030, 2035 is we will close that gap to about 36%, but we are still going to be very dependent. I know it was before your time, but back in 1973, when the Arabs cut the oil that they were coming, it was coming out of the Gulf through OPEC, from OPEC to us, how much did they cut? How much? 10%. 10%. Only 10% crippled us, crippled us as a nation. That's national security. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, beyond that, aren't we? We are. Yeah. Plus, it's a little bit of increased stability in the futures market, and we can talk about that. But the primary concern is what's going on in Iran. And everybody going, oh, well, if something happens to the Straits, I'll show you a picture coming up. That could be a big deal. That could block the oil coming out of the Gulf, and that could hurt us. So I'm going to buy now because somebody else is going to push that price up through bidding, and that gets into the futures market. This is a good background slide, though. You can see that we just came down below 50% uh, of our oil imports. Uh, so that means that we are producing, based on our consumption, a little bit more than 50% here in the United States. And I'll break it down for you further in the upcoming slides. That's probably a good thing. One thing to look at, though, is how many times we've kind of been through this. We've been down less than 50% before. But we've changed our mind and said, oh, 
price of oil is coming down because it comes down with consumption. We'll go out and buy SUVs and such. And oh, by the way, I own one and a truck, so I'm just as guilty. So the president got some newer numbers. He says we're down below 45%. Um, I will update my slides that correspond with his. It's the same source information. Um, primarily in the forward outlook, Energy Administration comes out with what they call the annual energy outlook. And this is their quick peak that they do in uh, late January. Primary reasons, they foresee consumption coming down in 2035. Increase of our, our own production, we've already seen that. Increased use of biofuels, we've done some of that. We've done about as much as we can right now. We need some more technology breakthroughs. Demand reduction, What's like what you were talking about, EJ. But they're attributing it to the new energy efficiency standards. Those won't kick in in seriousness until about 2017. So we should feel the effects in about 2035. Uh, Rising energy prices. We saw with 2008, prices pushing up over a dollar a four dollars a gallon. Next thing you know, everybody starts slowing down, not taking vacations, things like that. We're hearing the same thing this summer, right? Energy Information Administration is saying it's probably going to go above four dollars a gallon. How do they know? There are those things called the futures market with contracts. Those are already getting pushed up to the point where it translates to about 350 a gallon. Then when you add about the 40 cents for taxes, for the federal tax, for the highway tax, as well as the state, it's going to be awfully close to $4 a gallon. Hate to break that to you. Don't you wish we could be like the airlines and buy a futures contract and just, you know, buy it now because we know it's going to go up? Here's a big concern. And I'm going to talk about actually where we physically get our fuel from coming up. But this is monetarily what goes on with the price of fuel. It's a global commodity, meaning regardless of where it comes from, it evens out in price. And in fact, we actually have to mix some of this oil because some of it coming out of certain places like Venezuela is very, very thick. And we need to use some uh, lighter, sweeter stuff, lower sulfur content stuff that comes out of Louisiana to mix with it in order to be able to refine it. So in the process of doing that, it pretty much levels the price. And some of you may be actual commodities brokers who know more about it than I do, but you're seeing a shift from West Texas Intermediate as the baseline over to um, Brett Crude. So that's something to keep an eye on as well, because that usually runs a little bit higher price, and that's driving the price up a little bit as well. Here's some big numbers for you. Not very pleasant ones. 2010, the trade deficit. $265 billion just attributable to petroleum. We are actually exporting some petroleum here. Does anybody know that? You probably heard that we actually have uh, a net export of petroleum versus our import. There's some misgivings in those numbers, though. Primarily what we export is finished products, gasoline and diesel. Anybody know why our diesel prices have stayed up since uh, we switched over to low sulfur diesel? It's now compatible with the European requirement. We overproduce diesel, we put it on a ship and we ship it to Europe and we sell it to them at a higher price and that's part of the free market system. It keeps our price higher because it's competitive on a global market now. Brand new number. 44% of the total deficit in 2011 was due to petroleum. We still import more oil, process it into gasoline, diesel, finished products, export some of it, in fact, a little bit more than what we actually need right now. But we still overall are a huge importer of oil. The tune of about nine million gallons, yeah, nine million gallons, I'm sorry, nine million barrels a, a day. Because the price of oil is up, we are transferring our wealth to the tune of about $1,042 per man, woman, and child in the United States every year. 1000 for you, 1000 for you, 1000 for you, 1000 for you, 
is going overseas to somebody else. Just in our trade deficit. We don't see that because of all the markets and things like that. That's a lot of money. Here's what we talked about with the price spikes. If something happens in Iran and threatens the Gulf, and I'll show you a picture, I'll zoom in of the, um, the straits here is coming up. If that gets shut down, that will significantly impact the price of oil to the point where the folks at the Energy Information Administration cannot even forecast how high it will go. It's that much of an unknown. You say, hey, wait, we've got this strategic petroleum reserve. Yep, we do. It takes about three weeks to bring it online. It's uh, crude oil that we've had in storage. It's actually light sweet crude, which is good. The problem is, is most of our refineries have switched over to be able to process the really hard to deal with cruddy crude, the thick stuff that comes out of Venezuela, comes out of the oil sands up in Canada, things like that. So we would actually have to still buy some of that stuff and mix it with our stuff that's in that strategic petroleum reserve in order to get gasoline out of it. So that supply, just on its own, will last us about 75 days. That supply, mixed with what we currently produce, will last us about six months. And you're saying, why don't we use some of it to actually lower the price? Sure, we could do that. It completely wipes out the futures market. It actually does not promote trust among the market and open market system throughout the world. So that's part of the reason we have chosen not to do that. Another important slide. What you see up there in the green is the OPEC reserve capacity by year. In the red is everybody else. That red number keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. To the point now, with that new report I told you about that Congress has for, if something happens to where somebody goes offline, one of our suppliers like Nigeria, Venezuela, Canada, only 3% of the global reserve will come out of one country. You want to take a guess? Saudi Arabia. Nearly everybody else is producing at their max capacity right now. That should be a concern. We don't get uh, a lot of oil, if any, out of Russia, because most of it's going to Europe, by the way. OK, so tied in with that thought, that pleasant thought, by the way, is the fact that a lot of these companies, the ones up in green there, are OPEC companies. You see down in number 17 is ExxonMobil. In the ranking of reserves, ExxonMobil is number 17. Is that significant? Absolutely, because they're always going in other countries to actually get a lot of their oil as well as here in the United States. All those other companies are either OPEC or a nationalized oil company. Until you get further down, and you see uh, Royal Dutch Shell, Chevron, those are privately owned companies. Exxon is number 17 on that list, but it's the only privately held company at that level. Everybody else is a nationalized oil company. And part of the OPEC, the ones in green are part of OPEC. What's the problem with nationalized oil company? Do they use the best technology? Do they stay on top of their game? No. So if they even have a mechanical fault and go offline, we will be affected, and it will affect the price of oil. That's a concern. You can see the reserves up here. Another point with this great graph. The way it works for OPEC is the more reserves you have, the more you can sell. So Saudi having the most reserves, they're able to sell the most. Is there any incentive to actually report how much oil you think is in the reserves, or do you just keep reporting what you've always reported? Or actually increase the amount of reserves you think you have? Increase. The more I report I have, the more I can sell. It's one of the rules in the OPEC rule book. And oh, by the way, it's mostly voluntary reporting. Okay? So that can be a challenge as well. We should take away is that looks like a lot of oil, but we're really not super sure that that's exactly right. And we don't have a good way of verifying it. 
Okay. I know it's probably a little before your time. But in the uh, State of the Union address in 1980, President Carter basically established what we all know now as the Carter Doctrine. Every president has recognized it since, still recognized when we study politics, national security strategy here in the United States. Oh. That was a very strong statement. The world still respects that statement. Any means necessary. And you can see why with the dependency. And if you go back to the previous chart I had with the green and red, if you look back at 73, and I apologize, I can go back to it if you want to. But we had more options where we could go for that spare or excess oil. We only can go to OPEC pretty much right now. That is a concern. Okay, where do we get fuel today? Oil, petroleum. 27%, if you can't read it, I apologize, the small slide is coming out of Canada. Talked about uh, the Keystone XL. There's already a pipeline that's moving oil from Canada down to us. The new pipeline would actually double the capacity, further increase the capacity significantly to about 380,000 barrels per day. And it would be run along the Bakken uh, area up in North Dakota to pick up some of that oil. Right now, we're moving the oil out of Bakken, which is coming out of our own country here, via rail, which is incredibly inefficient. So that would help us out quite a bit. Are there con some, some concerns? Absolutely. Coming through Nebraska, huge concern. So, look for that in the news. Now you'll know a little bit more. But look who our next largest supplier is. Saudi Arabia. Mexico. We actually export an awful lot of finished products back down to Mexico. But we get a lot of oil from them. Venezuela. All the way up, Iraq. I don't know if you can see it, but here in the darker, bolded uh, numbers, those are all the oil pack, uh, OPEC countries. Now, I've got UK down the bottom. We're not, at this snapshot, getting anything from the UK, the north uh, shores right now. But uh, if we had them there, it would be 15 uh, countries total that we typically get oil from. Right now, on that snapshot, 8 out of 14 were OPEC countries. That's fairly significant. Here's where we're getting it from. We didn't have any come out of Sudan, primarily. Sudan is not producing any oil right now. They stopped in the end of January. Anybody know why? Split, civil war, conflict, right across here. Southern Sudan has the oil. Unfortunately, the pipeline goes through northern Sudan. They had an agreement. We'll produce, pump it through the line, we'll both take a share. Northern Sudan said, hey, we're not going to play. So Southern Sudan said, fine, we're going to stop producing. So who typically buys from Sudan? China. Very good. So if China can't buy from Sudan and they've got the fastest growing economy, where else are they buying it from? Iran. So they're in kind of a predicament right now, too. They've got to make a choice to follow the rest of the world and not buy from uh, Iran. They still need oil. So where are they going to buy it? All the places the United States buy it from. So what's that going to do to the price? All the way up. I know it's a lot of gloom and doom, but it's reality. Okay. Choke points. How we ship it. You'll see this thick line coming over the United States. Energy Information Administration is actually going to change that and make the thicker portion of the line go this direction with their next revision. The data here is 2009, they're supposed to give me a new graph because the amount of oil coming out through the Straits of Hormuz is 17 million barrels per day. That is a lot of oil. 17 million barrels per day. Straits of Malacca, not a super big concern to us, but think about it. Japan, about a year ago, in two days, had Fukushima. With the tsunami, how have they replaced that electrical power generation? Oil. They're using a lot of it. So they're a big consumer. So these choke points are also a huge concern. 
So we get a lot of oil that comes up here to Louisiana primarily. Uh, and they actually refine it, push it out. They actually export some of it. Some of it goes back down to Mexico. A lot of it goes overseas. We use a lot of it. And then uh, we also um, move some of it overseas because they need the lighter sweet crude that we produce here in Louisiana in order to make their refineries run. So that can be a bit of a challenge as well. Our oil companies are so efficient, though, they made that fairly transparent to us. And I will tell you, if you look at the numbers, what they buy the oil at and what the equivalent that they sell the finished products at, they're not really making any money. That's why we heard about refineries shutting down, because they're going out of business. They actually are paying more for the basic oil product than what they're able to sell the gasoline for in some cases. Businesses cannot stay in business by doing that. The promised choke point slide. Straits of Hormuz, 21 miles across. Two mile wide area going in, two mile wide area going out. Lots of traffic. If perhaps Iran does something or threatens to do something, what's that going to do to the insurance rates that those guys pay? Currently, it costs about $2 per barrel of oil to move it from the Middle East over to our refinery on one of the big ships. In the time of movement, that cargo will be bought and sold on an average of 13 times through the futures market. 13 times. I'll go back one slide, two slides. As it's moving and coming out through here and coming down through here, because these ships are so big, they don't like to take them out in the big open ocean. They kind of hug the coast. We have some folks here who like to kidnap ships, cause problems. That's another national security challenge for us. And it can interrupt our oil flow. Now, almost everything I've shown you up here up to this point has been from the Energy Information Administration as my sourcing documents. So it's not any private companies or anything like that. Unfortunately, I would have liked to have gotten this data from a GAO audit being our U.S. government. No congressman has ever asked how much it costs defense-wise to ensure that we have that flow of oil. But we have had some private folks put some numbers together. As recently as last October, uh, CNAS put this number together, $74 billion a year that we spend to ensure, just on defense to ensure the free flow of oil. It is so hard to figure out that number. A couple years back, um, Rand Corporation put this ballpark together. It's about accounting. That number seems to fall fairly close in the middle of there, maybe hedging a little bit towards $143 billion a year. You don't see that in your price of gas. Every taxpayer is paying that. As a driver, you're getting off by not having to pay as much as maybe somebody who doesn't have a vehicle. So it's expensive. So what's the future outlook? OECD countries, after World War II, the Organization for Economic uh, Development, Cooperation and Development, excuse me, United States, European countries, Japan, Australia, formed an organization, fastest growing economies up until recently. The non-OECD countries, think China, think India, almost everybody else in Asia except Japan and uh, Australia. Here's us in the blue. Here's them in 2008. Here's the forecast. The fastest growing economies are really starting to consume some oil. You know, by the way, remember the guy on the horse? They like that picture too. They want to be able to do the same thing when they have it on their own vehicle. They are attributing that growth primarily to increased demand for transportation, especially personal transportation. If you look in uh, China, there's actually an awful lot of Buicks over in China right now. We are exporting vehicles. One of our largest exports. Boeing is one of our largest exports. That's good. But realize that they are consuming the energy that we used to buy. We are actually not importing as much, but they're starting to import 
at a much faster rate. That's going to keep that price of oil up. Here's just a shot of some of those exports. You can see those were increasing. Primarily, we're exporting fuel down to Latin America. How about Brazil? Are they a net importer or exporter? Exporter. Big country. Developing fast. Biofuels, very good. What's amazing is to read an article with a picture of a Chevy S10, probably manufactured here in the United States, that can run equally as well on 100% ethanol alcohol as it does on gasoline. It has a small additional gas tank underneath the hood that the driver keeps full. They start the car on gasoline, switch over to ethanol, drive it on ethanol. You can see it doesn't have the same energy content. It's also a lot cheaper. Why? Because it still has a little bit of water in it. Ethanol, to make it what we call anhydrous ethanol, so you can mix it with gasoline, you see in your fuel, you know, 10% or less, 15% or less they've talked about, E85. We have to basically distill that down to the point where there's no actual water in there in order to mix with the gasoline. That additional distillation process of about 6% takes 30% more energy. A third of the energy just to get rid of that last little bit of water. If we did the same thing as Brazil, we could really help ourselves out. We have the technology. We are likely actually manufacturing those vehicles and those kits to do that. Haven't heard about it here in the United States, so have you? We don't have anything set up to do that, do we? Be awfully nice if we did. Burns cleaner. Our energy choices. Decrease consumption, increase uh, our production, or look for alternatives. Have those changed in 40 years? No. The president came out with a uh, blueprint for energy security about a year ago. Actually, like I said, on the 30th of March. That's basically what it says. On the intro, though, he really highlighted the challenge. Yeah, I think you can agree. If the price is up, we're very interested. This is a hot topic. If the price is down, something else uh, interests us. We're not as concerned with energy. That's probably something we need to change. And it's really up to our generation to do it, because we're getting ready to hand this off to another generation. Here's what it basically says. As we said, expand our domestic oil consumption and our production as well as uh, we see it with natural gas. Think about the triangle, though. There's some challenges with that. Everybody says, hey, Bakken's doing great. OK, here's a little bit of the rest of the story on Bakken. We go down, we horizontally drill. We hit the oil. And we expect to have the oil flow, which it does pretty good initially. The challenges they've had, and they can't predict it exactly, and I'm sure they're going to fix some of the, the future challenges with it are, it flows really well, but when it drops off, it rapidly drops off. Like, if one day I'm producing X amount, it could drop off by 90% by the end of the month. And then they've got to pull that out and redrill another hole. So, yep, there's a lot of oil up there, but it's just not very easy to access. Canadian oil sand, pretty much uh, associated with what Canada's doing. Is Canada still following Kyoto? As far as uh, greenhouse gas emissions, nope, they've stepped back just like we have. They've actually increased their greenhouse gas emissions by like 30%, primarily because of the uh, oil sands production. Everybody wants the oil? They've got it. The price of oil is high enough that they can actually make money by uh, shipping it down here in the United States, so they're doing it. And we like that because we'd rather have it come from Canada than from someplace else. Or innovation. Everybody's heard about Solyndra and all the other things, and you go, ah, oh, we're just wasting money. We don't start someplace and take some risk. We're going to keep doing the same thing we've been doing for the last 40 years. We really need to get with it on the uh, alternative. I take you back to that slide. This is not an easy problem to solve. Gasoline, as nasty as it smells, is really 
something we've grown accustomed to. We want to keep this way of life. I think we want to keep this way of life for our kids and their kids. We have got to get on top of this problem. Uh, Hello, are we working? Yes. I have a question with regard to uh, some uh, things I've seen in the paper recently about the fact that there apparently is quite a lot of oil off the uh, coast of Cuba. And I don't know at what point they are in the development of it or right. what we're going to try to do about it. Can you comment on that, please? I haven't heard it. Am I on? Can you hear me? Good. I haven't heard as much about that. I mean, I've heard a little bit about it. I haven't heard where they're going with the discovery. I can tell you that most of those uh, OPEC companies have got what we call the easy access. And so companies like the US companies have got the difficult asp um, aspect of going after that kind of oil. So in Russia, it's pretty easy to get the oil. Drill down, got it, no problem. Our US companies are having to go offshore primarily. They've got to build the infrastructure, do a lot of research. So when they spend all that money to drill that hole, especially if they have to go real deep like the BP platform did, um, that can be a challenge. That's a lot of money, a lot of investment, and a lot of time. So even if they said, hey, it's ready to go right here, right now, if they've got to build a new rig, that could be 10 years from now that they actually are actually producing. So it takes a while. Come in. Come in. Come in. Tom, what's happening with research in efficiency of, you know, Primarily, um, here's a, another step for you. Every building, and especially this one, because I helped do some of the energy audits for it, lose about 40% of their energy. Now, the new housing standards, and I'm going towards housing as opposed to uh, vehicles right now, because it is so high, we lose 40% of the energy from our houses, typically. Um, that's a lot. A lot of it's through glass like this. It's very beautiful, but it transmits energy from heat to cold. Now, there's something called a heating degree day. What that is is below 65 degrees, they measure every single hour of every single day throughout the year. So the more that temperature difference is and the longer it is, the more inefficient we typically are at heating a house. So where I'm from in Minnesota, they've got a lot more. So we're trying to make some very good efficiency progress there. It's also very expensive to retrofit. So you're looking at some of the newer houses are coming out, switching from two by four construction, two by six construction. Yeah, it's stronger in the house, but it also allows us to put more insulation in between. I can tell you, if you're not happy with your energy bill, probably the first thing you ought to do is try and get an energy audit. I did some certification work in that over the summer, again, as a hobby. But to put a blower door on your house, suck some of the air out so we can see where it's leaking in, allows us to figure out just how much energy you're losing. So the best thing you can do is get an energy audit to figure out how much energy you're losing. Um, we are making some progress as far as vehicles, and those are the two biggest things. I may have danced around the question a little bit, EJ, but is that what you were kind of looking for? At, like, communications has expanded tremendously and, and gotten small and all of this. Right. Um, and is much more efficient in using bandwidth. Um, are we doing some of the same? Do we have any organizations that are working on efficiencies of engines and, Absolutely. and changing how they run? I mean, you know, every so often somebody talks about the perpetual motion. Right. Yeah, uh, they're working on some of those things. They're working on some uh, uh, typical an aircraft engine. You've got horizontally opposed pistons. Well, they're actually having the pistons come towards each other. So they can vary depending on their uh, workload, how much fuel they're actually using. They're working on some things like that. Uh, a lot of what Congress has asked the Department of Defense to do is develop some of those things in the future, both on the building side, we're trying to get much more efficient. But we realize, especially in Iraq, surrounded by oil, we are tethered to this supply of oil coming through all these convoys and vehicles. We feel it even more in Afghanistan now that our southern supply route through Pakistan has been cut off. So everything is coming in from the north. So you may have heard something about $400 a gallon of gas, fully encumbered price. And we were saying, oh, that's only on some exceptions. We got to airdrop it in. Well, that was about a year ago when we weren't airdropping very much. 
Now we're air dropping a lot more. So yeah, we're pushing 400 bucks a gallon on some of the fuel going to our troops in Afghanistan, those real remote areas. So if you think about it, a gallon of gas coming off of our KC-135s into a fighter or something like that, that average is uh, somewhere between 60 and $80 a gallon. So because of all the refinery, moving it, getting into position, burning it on the tanker, as well as feeding it into the fighter, that's some pretty high prices. So we, within the Department of Defense, have been asked by Congress to really focus on getting more energy efficient, which makes us more effective. So if you get on and look on the internet about some of the things the Marines and the Army are doing, as well as the Air Force, the Air Force has really done some significant improvements with the C5 mic model or M model. Much more efficient engines. We're converting a lot of our old B model C5s over to that. Some of our other aircraft are getting much more efficient as well. Just in our flight paths and our routing, much more efficient. Not carrying extra weight, pulling some of the extra stuff of equipment that we don't necessarily need all the time, but we'd like to have on board. It's not safety equipment, but it's more like how many spare pallets may be on a, a cargo aircraft, pulling all that excess stuff off to get these aircraft as light as they can be to, in order to be able to save energy. Not launching a tanker out of England just to refuel somebody because it was a training flight and they miscalculated. We'll have them divert in as opposed to go to their final destination and we'll save gas that way. So those are some of the things that we're doing on the DOD side. Technology-wise, you'll see our troops are using photovoltaics that they can take out in the field and recharge their batteries. We were going through batteries like you wouldn't believe. Once they were expired, we just kind of throw them away. Now we're actually recharging those in the field much more actively using solar power, solar vo photovoltaic. We're installing a lot of solar photovoltaic over in Afghanistan to run our small headquarters in some of these villages with the intent that we're going to leave it there for the, he the, uh, the village to use and turn it into like a medical hospital or something like that. So that's some of the research and development we're doing. We certainly could be doing a lot more. So uh, it's more bucks. Absolutely. Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah. One of the uh, points, excuse me, <laughs> one of the points that our Republican presidential candidates are making that is if they're made president they're going to cut the uh, cost of gas in the United States uh, some one as low as two dollars and fifty cents can you envision anything they can do as president administratively to uh, do this I, I kind of would like them to show all of us academics to include yourselves who are now energy experts how they intend to do that um, it just it costs a lot of money to drill for oil. It costs a lot of money to go for this unconventional oil, for the sand, uh, oil sands up in Canada. And they will stop producing. They will lay people off, stop the equipment, if the price of oil drops before a certain amount. In the past, it was like $80 a barrel. Because um, they're, they're free market companies. They can't lose money and expect to stay in business, right? And that's a system we all signed up for. So there's lots of gas that's already been drilled, like up in Marcellus we're not using yet because the price hasn't gone back high enough to where it's cost effective for them to actually pull it out of the ground. They've drilled, they know where it is, it's ready to pull out, just got to put the pipelines in and we can do it. Now, going back to one horizontal chart, there's a similar chart out there, I should have probably put it in the briefing, that shows how we compare, I might have Oops, there it is. Those are our U.S. reserves of oil compared to everybody else. 20.7 billion barrels of oil. If you compare it to what everybody else has, not a lot. Now, if we start pulling that out, we're just going to become more dependent until we figure out some alternative. That's the trade-off between do we import or do we use our own? Obviously, we would rather be self-sufficient, but if we keep using our own, then we'll be at risk for having to be more dependent in the future on foreign oil. So I'm not sure how those numbers come together. I think every president, from when they run to when they actually get in office, find out a lot of new information. It's been a, an observation of, me from, of mine for a couple of years. 
Sir, ma'am, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, my son worked on the oil rigs in Alaska for about 10 years for varying oil companies. He said every well was always capped. And the theory was that we're saving our reserves. We have a lot more than we're admitting. And we're going to use uh, foreign oil for as long as we can until we're in a real emergency. So what do you know or feel about that? I think if you look at the consumption I always think a picture's worth a thousand words, right? If we had the laptop here, I could have done this from up here. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize it was that far back. That was our philosophy during this time frame. Use as much overseas as you can to save the U.S. oil. Now, we are using more U.S. oil. It's more expensive oil. Part of the reason the price is up that we're using our own, but it's driven by the global market. So it's not like we're driving it up ourselves, but the fact that it's up higher means it makes sense to use more of our own. So that's why this particular graph looks like, hey, great, we're using more. That's only because it's more expensive overseas and it's more profitable for us to use the oil here. Once again, we are a free market system. We've done a lot of drilling. It's really hard to get oil, and like Bakken, we may not necessarily know how long it's going to be able to flow, but we're going to use it sometime in the future. So, if it was cheaper overseas, yeah, we kept oil wells and used overseas oil. If it's more expensive overseas, to make it to where the break point is such that our companies can recover their investment and their costs, then we're going to use our own oil. Now, I will tell you, overall, the North Slope oil, the production is dwindling down. So we're going to have to do a significant amount of drilling up there. And we're talking about going out into the open ocean on the North Slope uh, shortly. The problem is there's still too much ice out there. But I can tell you, just uh, from our speaker last year, from ExxonMobil's perspective, they're already doing the technological uh, research to be able to do that. Absolutely. That's why there's this increasing interest in the North Pole and where everybody plops that North Pole and says, hey, this is ours. And that's why it's going to be a future issue because of the oil that's up there, perceived oil that's up there. Did I get at your question? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. My son was over this morning, and he has a number of mechanics who are friends of his. And he says that they can always determine when they open an engine whether it's used gasoline or ethanol. Hmm. If it has used ethanol, the engine is destroyed. Really? If, it, if it uses gasoline, the engine may not be destroyed. But it won't be destroyed the same way. The gasoline. You may have answered part of that by saying the water is in the in ethanol. I don't know. Uh, if 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 so, why aren't they working on that primarily as the cause rather than spending us into the poorhouse buying oil, yes, buying corn? I would really like to see that engine, or certainly I will give you my phone number. And I would love to talk to your son and have him show it to me, because I have not heard that. But uh, I agree with you. Why are we not using more ethanol? Uh, we're using quite a bit of ethanol right now. We're mixing it with gasoline. In the process of mixing it with gasoline, that's when we have to actually go from what normally would run an engine all by itself, like they use in Brazil. We have to take that last 6% of water out of that ethanol to make it anhydrous ethanol. Otherwise, it will separate when it's mixed with the gasoline. If we use just straight ethanol, it's about 92% ethanol, 68% water, it'll run fine. The engine will run fine. Not a problem. Okay? The ethanol that we have in our gasoline is fine. If you're running E85, you're fine as long as your vehicle is an E85 vehicle. When it says E85, E85 is the maximum amount of ethanol that's in that fuel. It could be as low as 40%. They're just saying... The maximum amount is E85. It all depends on the blends and how the time of year and the availability of ethanol and the price of ethanol. Ethanol was more subsidized up until recently, and some of those subsidies have gone away. So you've seen that price between E85 and regular gasoline get a little bit closer, but we're still using some of it. I hope I got to answer your question there, but I would really like to see that engine because I have not heard that.
Oh, really? Okay. Contact you. And that's the first thing. The second question is, uh, no, I, I can't remember it now. So that's, that's the only question I had. Okay. Yeah, if, uh, if you'd like to uh, get my phone number, I would love to uh, talk to him about that because that's more learning for me and makes me a better speaker. And I'm just darn interested in it, too. So, absolutely. Yes, sir. I really appreciated all the uh, data and statistics that you had uh, put forth. And one that I had never seen before was the uh, BTUs per gallon for the different types of, uh, of energy. It was, right. uh, it, and that causes some questions. Okay. Uh, we know uh, uh, the ethanol problems of fiasco and an, an unfeasible thing to do that we've been forced upon us. And that if we used instead of corn to make ethanol, we could mm. use uh, sugar cane and get four times the amount of ethanol per ton as yep. we can from corn. So it's Sounds a very right. it economic a dumb thing to do. Yeah. And I'm glad the subsidies are gone. But raise my questions regarding the BTUs values mm -hmm. that were on there. Uh, ethanol was almost four times, uh, or three times rather, uh, than uh, the, uh, the, the, the liquid uh, natural gas. And I was surprised at the major differences between that. And of course, a lot of the automotive companies are converting and building cars with the uh, liquid natural gas and with that energy differential of three times is that even practical to consider first of all we're we're keeping it here um, both compressed natural gas liquid natural gas liquefied petroleum is usually right here now they do transport it some of it globally it's very difficult to transport it costs a lot of money especially when you liquefy it and you really have to drop the temperature down of the liquid uh, natural gas in order to get into the liquid. And even when you compress it, it's a huge ship to do that. Japan has to deal with that because they don't have any of their own resources, so they're the primary consumer of some of the things coming out of, for example, Yemen of natural gas. The best part about natural gas is it's here in the United States that we're actually developing that and taking it to a pump and making it available, even though the energy content is lower. So up at Penn State, for example, a um, aggregate firm has donated two trucks that they are working with to actually convert over. Now, they're, they're still debating if they're going to use compressed and put the compressed tanks in or if they're going to use the liquefied and put that sort of system on that in order to do the testing. Um, there's trade-offs with both. Primarily, the trade-off is you have to actually refuel either one more frequently because of that lack of energy content. So, if you're thinking about a large aggregate firm who's running a lot of these larger gravel trucks, that means they've got to stop, refuel, get going again, which in order to have the same production level means they have to buy more trucks, hire more people, and the price of roads goes up for all of us. So that's part of the trade-off. That's why gasoline is so good with its energy content, and diesel is even better, that we've stuck to those and have not gone to alternatives, because none of the alternatives are as good as gasoline or diesel right now. Right now. Now, if we can make the vehicles more efficient, absolutely they could be. A lot of the vehicles you're going to see come out, and uh, Mr. Pickens of T. Boone Pickens fame is really pushing this because it's produced here in the United States. It's the smaller cars, especially for use in the bigger cities. Now, remember that triangle going to the environmental impact. Methane getting into the atmosphere is 20 times worse than CO2 getting into the atmosphere. I'm worried about greenhouse gases. Methane can actually accelerate that problem quite a bit. So if you think about more people, natural gas is pretty well sealed. We're using our homes and all that sort of stuff. But people are going to the fuel stations and actually plugging in vehicles. There's going to be a little bit of loss between plugging in the system, fueling, and then unplugging the system. Well, across a couple million vehicles, that can be fairly significant. So that's some of the concerns environmentally. So almost everything that we talk about, think about that triangle I put up there for you, because it impacts us one way or another, either economically, environmental security-wise, or um, energy security-wise. Yes, sir. Ma'am, yeah, I'm sorry. Would you please explain fracking and how concerned we should be about it? Sure. Can you forward my slides all the way to almost the last one? And you'll see a fracking diagram on there. 
You can unblank it if you need to. Or I can do it. I actually brought a long diagram. I was expecting to get this question. And it was in your reading a little bit, talking about pavilion. Um, out in the pavilion Wyoming area, they believe that some of the fracking material actually got up into the water supply. If you actually go into the Congressional Research Service report, which is basically a summary of everything the Environmental Protection Agency did, we go one or two more. Can't remember where I kept all my backups. There we go. Looks familiar. This is a Marcellus kind of fracking thing. The reason I wanted to show this is up in Pavilion, which was talked about in your reading. They only came down just a little bit below 1,000 feet and then went horizontal and were doing the fracking. They weren't even into the real shale out there in Wyoming. They were actually into sandstone. And they believe that because that was early on and they misused the technology potentially, that that caused, I don't want to say anything that might get me into a legal liability lawsuit, but that's just based on the summary of the report. So, because they were just in sandstone, there is some gas there, and they were actually pulling that out. The problem was, is because it's very porous, also that fracking material could have polluted some of the water supply, because here's where your water supply typically is. It's only about 100 to 150 feet down below the surface for individual homes. In the case of Pavilion, the city water is down about 500 feet. EPA drilled two pilot wells, found some of the material in there. The challenge was there appears to be two different problems. For the local water supply, they've been doing a lot of different things in that area for a long period of time. There are a lot of tailings sitting in ponds, and they think some of that might have seeped down and polluted some of the local water supply. What's in your basic home pump system that's only going down about 100, 150 feet. In the city water, down about 500 feet, they think it's because they were fracking into the sandstone as opposed to being all the way down in the shale. This is a diagram that's available off the web. I actually got it from one of those Congressional Research Service reports, and they had borrowed it from somebody else. That shows up from Marcellus, they're going down quite a bit deeper before they're going horizontally, so well below any problem with the water supply. The other thing they're doing, and what they've really pushed hard to do, is this reinforcement of the casing. That's like a triple layer, and then they inject concrete down between the steel and the soil to make sure that fracking material doesn't follow back up and get into the soil here. So they've really started taking some pretty significant precautions to protect the water supply, because we know that's very significant. Is there a risk? Absolutely. There's a risk in everything we do. So once again, that's why I find that triangle is so useful because everything we choose to do energy-wise has got an impact. Does that help? Sir. Uh, on alternative energy, so many of the, our European uh, countries are so far ahead of the United States, especially on uh, energy uh, associated with solar and wind energy. Uh, do you foresee the United States spending more in those two areas in the future, especially if our uh, energy consumption increases and the costs associated with that? Absolutely. Um, personally, I find it depressing that we have all these roofs around here that don't have solar panels on them. I find it depressing that we use a lot of good land. Go over Carlisle High School, we're using land to put solar panels in. We could have a roof on every house around here. The price of solar panels is dropping so significantly and will continue to drop fairly significantly that it's pretty cost beneficial for all of us to have a solar panel on top of our roof. And you may say, hey, that's $18,000 I don't have right now. Well, what if the utility company put it in, basically, and maintained it and sold you the electricity at a much cheaper rate? They wouldn't need as much nuclear, we'd still need it. Certainly wouldn't be burning as much coal, which is better for the atmosphere. You know, by the way, more people die in a coal mine than are associated with any sort of nuclear incident that occurred. So I'm somewhat depressed by the fact that we're not pushing that technology better and faster. <coughs> Again, on the solar, there's some new technology coming out because right now we basically have to take uh, an ingot that we form on a semiconductor material, slice it up, cut it down, 
manually build these panels, form them together, and they're actually getting pretty good. We're looking at skipping a couple of those steps by actually growing the crystals on a sheet of foil and putting that into the panel. And that would actually make it much cheaper, much faster to actually produce, and easier to put up on your roof. And if you put it on your roof, your roof through that panel is absorbing a lot of the heat that normally goes into your house and causes your air conditioner to run. So that's one more layer of protection that actually helps insulate your house from some of that summer heat. So another beneficial factor there. Should you do it? Absolutely. Do you want me to jump into wind or do you guys really want to ask another question? Yes. Yep, and that's for solar thermal. You know, by the way, on solar thermal, it's a great company uh, just down the road here in Chambersburg that's manufacturing a solar thermal system to help you with your hot water. What we really need to do is move them further down the road to where their panel and everything, their system would work, but our houses have integrated radiant floor heat, much like they use over in Europe, which you brought up, because if your feet are warm, the rest of your body's warm. I can tell you that my house was built in 1972 that I'm running here in Carlisle. I believe, personal opinion, everybody thought, as what was publicized in the late 50s, nuclear power would be too cheap to meter. So I actually have my heating elements for my home. Rather than have the baseboard heat, the electric heat is in between the sheetrock on my ceiling. So when I turn the dial up, I feel heat from up here. We don't feel warm. Um, so the, the radiant floor heating, if you integrate that within your house and use the solar hot water, that would be a great way to go. And you wouldn't really need that much heat. It doesn't have to be 100 degrees, for example. It only has to be a, a couple degrees above what you want. It will radiate up, you will feel warmer, and will use a lot less energy. And then that's just one more of the solar technologies. Another great technology for electricity, they've already got it in Spain, we're building it in the, uh, on the west, is the uh, solar tower with the mirrors. We're actually heating up molten salt, storing that underground, and using that molten salt to heat water, and we are generating electricity 24 hours a day by being able to store that heat. And so that's some of the things that we're doing. But like you said, over in Spain, they're ahead of us on that. The reason I pulled up this picture is a long answer to a short question. Here's Germany. Here's how much solar radiation they have not nearly as much as almost the entire United States except for up here in Alaska. That's Spain right there. We get more solar radiation in the continental United States than Germany, yet they're pushing about 25% renewables for their total energy right now between wind and solar. Here's another good story for you. Pacific National Labs did a study how can we expand up in the northwestern part of the United States from 3.3 gigawatts of electricity through wind that we can develop to actually expand that up to 14.4? And the issue is, show this one. Okay. This is a vertical graph, horizontal graph. As we're going throughout the day, this is midnight. Out here is midnight. Noon is about right here. That wind energy, if we want, say, this amount, is generating and then dropping down. Wind blows, generates up, and then falls off. If we actually produce, say, 60,000 Chevy Volts or light trucks with uh, electric motors in them and batteries, hooked it up to that, we could expand the wind grid up there to 14.4 gigawatts by almost four, four times as much as the current production because those batteries and with all those cars hooked up to the grid, they can absorb over generation, under generation and flatten out and make it so it looks just like it does right now with nuclear power or coal powering the grid. What you would do is you would hook your car up in your garage or hook it up in a parking lot. And as we're getting those spikes in electricity flow, all those batteries of 60,000 or more vehicles absorb those and cause us to basically flatten out the grid and make it stable. We currently cannot store electricity. Whatever they produce, we consume. In order to make sure that you can flip on that light switch 24 hours a day, we overproduce by about 30%. Overproduce by about a third that we waste and put into ground. 
just to have the reliability of every time you flip that switch, every time you're in surgery, every time you're someplace where you really need electricity, it's there for your need. We've got to kind of get past that with smart grid and some of the other technologies that are out there. Probably more than you asked for. Oh, there you are, man. Sorry. Crystal production has been a major industry in, Car in the Carlisle area. Okay, Is know. some of that currently being converted technologically into the, the solar panel I'm not, situation oh, that you mentioned? Well, I, I was not aware of that. Where are they producing? Where? Yeah. Um, I, I, the, lots of crystal companies in Carlisle really? and Mount Holly. Okay. Yeah, they've been in, in smaller, in, you, well, big industries, but more um, uh, you know, TVs and radio, all okay. that kind of I have stuff. not heard that. I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with that at all. I didn't realize they were producing it here. Yeah, okay. I have been. I'm sorry. Um, telephone companies use okay. crystals. Okay. No, I believe you. I just I was not yeah. aware of that. Okay. So I don't know the answer. Oops. Yes, sir. There you go. Right. So why are we not doing it? And I assume you mean why are we not doing it from a free market system? Absolutely. I agree with you. Um, and then why is the government not helping? Okay. If you go back to uh, the blueprint for energy security the president published last year on the 30th of March, a lot of great programs were listed in there that looked like they were kind of fragmented out. We have been pushing a lot of money towards uh, the Department of Energy to help facilitate those. They're doing a lot of great research. It's hard to get into the free market system if none of us, and I'm one of the us, are willing to take the risk to buy it. How many people are ready to go out and buy a Chevy Volt? Why not? I just told you that it's 90% efficient compared to 25% efficient burning fuel. Doesn't work, why? So is that a communication problem? Is that a risk management problem? Cost problem? Oh, wow. It didn't actually blow apart. But see, that's, uh, that's part of the misinformation that's going on. That's where the risk is and where the trust is. And that's why I admire all of you for coming to a lectures like this and getting out and looking at the news because there's a lot of misinformation about this stuff. So let's go back to Chevy Volt. During testing, they basically allotted two of the vehicles, probably more than two, doing all the testing. Vehicles ran fine. Later on, they found out internally that there was a leak. Okay? We're all comfortable with gasoline, right? Do we even hear about a car burning up in the driveway, a car actually burning up in the, fry, the, the freeway? We don't really hear about that stuff, right? Because we are comfortable with gasoline. It must have been something the owner did. But we hear about one little thing with the Chevy Volt. Oh, we're not going to buy it. It's not safe. Somehow, we, as Americans, need to regain our tolerance for risk. Some of the folks who came across the ocean, most of our ancestors, were more tolerant of risk and more willing to take risk in order to push this country ahead. We are a society that are unwilling to do that. How many folks have solar panels on the roof? You do, great. You like them? Okay, well, yeah, it's cheaper. But it may depend, but at least you're doing it. My hat's off to you. I don't know if I answered your question, but a lot of it is this risk that we're worried about in this misinformation. I had a chance to not drive. The guy offered me the opportunity to, but it was Washington, D.C., and I didn't really want to drive in Washington, D.C., but he showed me his Chevy Volt, and he's very proud of it. 
He's got, uh, I think it was like 16,000 miles on it, and he's only burned 17 gallons of gas. Do the math. Somebody's got a calculator. That's pretty good gas mileage, right? He plugs it in at his home, home in, in the evenings, commutes into Washington, D.C., doesn't even plug it in during the day, commutes back out, all in one battery charge. Has Uncle Sam figured out how to charge him road tax on that yet? He's only paid 17 gallons worth of road tax. <laughs> He's doing great things. And oh, by the way, He's saving a lot of energy because remember, we're overproducing. So he's using some of that overproduction, charging his vehicle. Runs great. Here's the other really neat secret about that. He told me, hey, I'm lined up in this SUV. He's right next to me. You've been down in DC. There's like three lines of traffic on this way. It goes down to one lane. This guy was like, I'm going to beat that little car off the line. Those electric car acceleration with those electric motors, beat nearly every gas motor except a super hot rod off the line, so to speak, at the red light. So, if you want to wake up the teenagers, buy a Chevy Volt. When they give you that, <laughs> hit the pedal and wave goodbye because you'll be way out ahead of them. I'll get that as soon as he gets you the microphone. That's good. So, um, the bottom line is, it's a great vehicle. It probably has a little bit of bugs to work out. What did everybody say about the Prius? I'll oh, never work, right? Prius is one of the best-selling cars out there right now. The Toyota Prius? Yep. Okay. It was not originally a plug-in. The newer models, my understanding is, they're actually a plug-in. So it was strictly generating electricity based on what it was using as far as recovering and the braking and all that sort of stuff. The Volt's got all that technology. The other thing about the Volt is it's got a gasoline engine, unlike the Nissan Leaf. So when the battery gets low, the gasoline engine kicks on. It has two modes, 2,500 RPMs, which is fairly flatline, and 5,000 RPMs if you're climbing Mount Olympia or something like that in your uh, Chevy Volt. So it can rapidly charge the battery if it needs to. So if you're going along and the battery's getting low, you don't have to pull over. It'll turn itself on, run the gas engine. Is the gas connected to the drive shaft, connected to the wheels? No. It turns a generator at that very efficient 2,500 RPMs. It will recharge the battery, and you can continue to use that vehicle. And it's got some great indicator lights to tell you where it is on its charge and all that sort of stuff. We are really working this technology. We just as a nation need to build the trust to start adapting. So I know I've got one over here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I also wondered, I can't remember the name of the minerals that, that are mined in China. 90% of them come from China. The rare earth? And rare earth minerals. Yep. Is there any solution for finding those elsewhere or finding a replacement for those to use in these special right. batteries? Yeah. It, I mean, you can find the rare earths in your cell phone. The reason your speaker and everything in your cell phone is so small is it uses some of those minerals in order to get that magnet small enough to where you can actually hear. And so we all are using the rare earths. Uh, in your reading, it talked about 2.2 pounds of Prius. That sounds kind of high. I, there were some other stats that were in your reading that were a little bit off. So I was going to go back and double check that one. Yeah, we're using them. We're using them in a lot of other things, too. Uh, a lot of it comes out of China. And you will hear that um, China has started jacking up the price. Here's kind of the rest of the story from a couple of folks in a conference I went to. We as Americans and the rest of the world said, hey, China, you're really kind of treating your workers poorly. Why don't you do more about that? So as they did more, especially in that industry, it drove the price up. As well as the fact that uh, Japan imports an awful lot of those because they do a lot of electronics, so they're feeling it as well. So we will feel it in our pocketbooks. Yeah. No easy replacement. Now, what we're looking at is trying to recover some of those, you know, when you turn your car back in, turn the battery back in. Now, the other thing the reading talked about is lithium. A lot of it comes out of South America. Yeah, we're shifting that. Some of it could come out of the Southwest. But as you saw in the picture of your reading, it's really easy. It's right on the surface. It's easy to mine. It's just that it's the third element, and it's the lightest metal, and so it's hard to work with. But it works really well in a battery. So it's easy to strip the electrons when it's the third element. You know, hydrogen's the first element. It's the third element. Uh, it's, I'm getting too much science, but it's, uh, it's pretty easy for us to work with that. And I went out and bought a lithium-ion powered drill 
you know with your normal um, rechargeable electric kinds of appliances, you leave it in the closet too long like those little vacuum cleaners and it just goes down by itself. That lithium ion battery, I can walk down the basement right now and it'll be almost as equally charged as it was two months ago when I charged it. It's just a really good battery design. We're still working out some of the kinks with it, but uh, it's really come a long way. Absolutely. Yes, sir. I'd go back to the free market thing, and it seems that some of the reluctance for us to, to make these transitions to solar panels or the vote are based on the, the bottom line when you start to run the numbers. We particularly looked at this, the solar panels on the roof for electric generation and talked with a nephew who's in that business in California. He said, you can't afford to do it in Pennsylvania because of the price of electricity that's coming through the, the lines to your house. And mm -hmm. So talk about that a little bit, if you would, please. Right. It is fairly cheap here, and out in California, they use a lot of natural gas. And the natural gas, there's no pipeline that goes out to California. I think there's one that may come in from Canada, but uh, it's a little bit more pricey out there, so break-even point. It's really when you want the break-even point to be. If you can tolerate, because you're going to be in your house for 20 years, a break-even point that's about 12 years, that's probably worth doing. In California, a friend of, actually a high school classmate who uh, I ran into last summer, is installing panels out in California. Their break-even point is about seven years, so it makes sense. There's something called solar renewable energy credits. Different states have different legislation. Pennsylvania has something called the uh, PA Sunshine Law, uh, where the electric companies must use a certain amount of renewable energy based on the law. You're paying for it. So what they basically do is go out and buy from individual people with solar panels. You probably have some of this. And you're probably more of an expert than I am. But based on the amount of energy you produce and use, they're almost paying you to use your own energy because that energy is going to come off the panel and through the lowest resistance probably go right into your house. If it doesn't go into your house, it will go into the grid. But either way, you're gener generating electricity that the power company does not need to generate. So they're actually paying you to do that. You're saving them from having to generate. And so the problem is they opened up that market beyond Pennsylvania. New Jersey has a closed market. Their solar energy renewable credits, we're running about 800 bucks a credit. And I'm not sure, I know it's the end of May when you'll calculate all that sort of stuff, but I don't know how much theirs were versus Pennsylvania. But that's some of the programs, and some of these programs are very fragmented, so you really have to study the information right now. And it's very frustrating from that perspective. Maybe a federal system across the board might be easier for some of those to help push the technology. Maybe the fact that we're going to this newer technology, it's still in the R&D phase, be able to grow crystals on foil, will bring the price down to the point where, it, as we say, be a no-brainer. You'll just put it in your roof when you build your house. But that's the transitions we're in right now. Absolutely. Hopefully that kind of that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I've been thinking about solar panels installing at my home. But I'm also, at the same time, buying green energy, uh, yeah. you know, wind power. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out why, why should I put solar panels on my house if I can buy green energy? You're for, literally buying those, uh, rebuying those solar energy credits probably from somebody else. Well... But for a penny more a kilowatt, you know, if yeah. it, it's, it's like for less than $100 a year, I can get green energy. Right. So, and, and if you're, you're interested in getting the, a, a market developed for green energy, it seems like you should support, <laughs> support the utility. Absolutely. That's part of it, though. I mean, that's a component of it. Yeah. Uh, you're buying it by uh, paying extra for buying green energy. But potentially this gentleman back here is the one who's generating it. And he's basically generating it and selling it back to a power company. So he's making money on that through his renewable energy credits, and you're paying for it. You probably didn't realize that, but that's how some of those mechanisms work. So that's you, all good. Right. I, I mean, the, uh, it, but, but it's costing me. I don't, I don't have to make that capital investment. You're right. Absolutely. Now, that's what I'm saying. If the utility companies would come out and say, hey, your roof is south-facing. We can put a bunch of panels up there. All you have to do is sign this and let us do it and we're going to give you basically this much of a break on your electricity, rather than paying a penny extra, you may be paying a penny less just by allowing them that access. That's some of the things that they're looking at going to, with lease systems rather than buying them, kinds of things, absolutely. Bruce, I threw this slide up here. 
is that kind of shows typically from 9 to uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon is when we get the most amount of solar radiation. Guess what? That's when we use the most amount of electricity here in the United States, if you think about it. Air conditioners kick in. Computers kick in in the office. You might not be home using your own electricity, but if you're pushing electricity from your roof back into the grid, somebody else is going to use it someplace. So solar just makes sense to me because that's when we use the most amount of electricity is during the daytime when we're all at work. This isn't work for me. This is fun. Yes, ma'am. Do you see much future for future for tidal power. Mm -hmm. The Bay of Fundy is experimenting with that, and there must be other areas around yep, they're the, using it. that they're they doing could. A lot of that. Absolutely. Uh, especially since they're improving the technology to move electricity. Like if you see the, uh, the wind that they're putting offshore to move electricity underwater, that'll make tidal even make more sense, because we lose what we call line loss. We lose a lot of voltage through that. And if we can get the metallurgy to the point where we can move electricity without as much line loss, that will actually uh, help out the wave energy as well. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Are, are the uh, more traditional uh, established uh, energy interests uh, aiding or uh, are they uh, hindering our movement towards some of the solutions you've been talking about? For example, I keep seeing this, these clean coal right. advertisements and that sort of thing on TV. Clean coal, I, that I've got to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, here's a, a bit of a war story. That, and, and you can, if you email me, I'll, I'll send you the document because it's a Congressional Research Service document. So, middle of West Virginia, or Virginia right on the border, but still coal country. A power company went to the board that basically controls the rates and said, we want to build a new power plant, but up front, we want to be able to do all the things we need to do to capture the CO2, it's called sequestration, and build that into the plant from the very beginning when it's going to be cheaper. Because we're worried about our inconsistent governmental policies of kicking in a requirement to basically capture CO2 in the future and it would be much, much more expensive to all of us if they had to go back and retrofit. Excuse me. So the board said, great, we'll take a look at this. They looked around and they said, show me where the requirement is for you to basically pull the CO2 out of your exhaust and capture it. We've heard a lot of talk, but there's no federal law that requires us to do that, and certainly there's no state law that requires us to do that. So. I know you want to raise the rates to help pay for this new plant to do all these great things, but since there's no law requiring it, we're not going to require it and we're not going to approve your increase of the rate. So even when good companies are trying to do the right thing, they're not being supported by our laws. So it's that tension within the system. And it's frustrating, especially with coal. Okay, that's fine. Sir. Let's try it again, please. Right. Uh, gas, uh, gas, natural gas is very plentiful. Uh, we're all aware of that. The prices come down drastically, 20, 30, 40, 50% over the last couple of years. In our plant, we use a lot of natural gas. Mm -hmm. We have booked solid for the through 19, or 2014 for our natural gas because it looks advantageous. Right. For those on the home front that want to save some money, the Germans are very uh, technically very good, and we heat our house by heat pumps. Now, when the weather is uh, mild, that's a very good way to do it. Mm -hmm. So what happens with the natural gas system that's been installed in my house, at 40 degrees, where you start to lose efficiencies on the heating of your air conditioning, it shuts off. And on comes the natural gas system to heat your house. Right. It saved a lot of money. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And, and being from the Midwest, where we use all natural gas and fuel oil, it's not even a concept. I mean, you couldn't find an HVAC guy who could fix a fuel oil system in the Midwest. They just don't do it. 
it was unusual for me to come to the Northeast and see so much fuel oil being used uh, out here. Uh, and I'm, other than the price of adding that line, even in my neighborhood, it was a significant amount of money to bring it up from the end of the street up into my yard of the house I'm renting, which is only about 150 feet in order to hook it up. I have to go back and go, somehow we built a fantastic electric grid in this nation about oh, the 1920s, 1930s. They got to everybody. It was actually built before then, but really out to everybody. It's been around since the 30s and 40s. That wasn't that long ago. Why can we not get everybody hooked up to natural gas? Because it makes sense. I agree with you. Here's a little bad news on the natural gas thing from Marcellus. They've just revised down significantly the amount of natural gas I think is technologically recoverable from what they were predicting just even a year ago. So when that advance report came out, that was one of the lines in there. And basically, it's revised down from a reserve of about 411 trillion cubic feet. I think it's down to about a third of that. So natural gas may not stay as cheap as what we want it to be, especially up in this area.